Hello, my name is Dan Lieberman. I'm a professor of human evolutionary biology. My research is on the evolution of human physical activity and how and why exercise is healthy. So everybody knows that exercise is healthy, but um, and there are lots of examples, but I want to begin by, by highlighting one really famous study. It's called the Harvard Alumni Study. It was done by a professor at Harvard Medical School named Ralph Paffenbarger. And Paffenbarger realized that you know, alumni are a fantastic population to study aging because Harvard keeps in track, track of the alumni every year, usually to ask them for money. So he got permission to study over 20,000 Harvard alumni from many different classes, and he followed them for, for, for 20 or so years. And, what he sh and he asked them all kinds of questions, and he was able to control for whether they smoked or whether they you know, had um, some other kinds of diseases, and, um, but also um, uh, how much they exercised. And what he showed was that Harvard alums who got uh, a reasonable amount of exercise, about 2,000 calories a week, when they were in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, they would die at about 21% lower rates than Harvard alumni who weren't exercising. So that's pretty impressive. But what he showed was that as the alumni got older, the effects of exercise were bigger. So by the time they were in their 50s, alumni who were exercising a reasonable amount died at 36% lower uh, death rates than the ones who were sedentary. And by the time they were in their 70s and 80s, the death rates were more than 50% lower, which is a massive effect. So what, what Paffenbarger showed, and of course many other studies have showed since then, is that not only does exercise help you live longer, but also that as you get older, exercise is more important. Now, lots of studies have studied why, you know, so, excuse me, how that's the case. You know, what are the mechanisms by which physical activity is healthy? But I'm especially interested in the question of why physical activity is, is, is so healthy and why uh, it may be very important, especially important for human beings. Now, to understand that, we, we need to first begin with an important distinction, and that is between physical activity, which is just moving your body, and exercise, which is discretionary, voluntary physical activity for the sake of health and fitness. Right? And until recently, nobody exercised, right? People were physically active because they had to be, right? They had to they had to be physically active in order to, to get their food. They had to be physically active in order to not be somebody else's food. They were also physically active because, you know, it was some, sometimes rewarding. They would play or, you know, or, you know learn skills, etc. cetera. But, but doing something like going to a gym and lifting weights whose sole purpose is to be lifted or, or running on a treadmill, which makes you work really hard and gets you absolutely nowhere, is a completely modern, strange, bizarre, weird thing to do, right? So exercise is a modern uh, uh, behavior that we essentially invented after the Industrial Revolution or during the Industrial Revolution uh, to su supplement the fact that people were no longer being as physically active in their, in their normal lives. And so we had to find other ways to be physically active. So another important fact to begin with is that we diverged from chimpanzees around about 7 million years ago. And, and it's important to understand that chimpanzees, like other uh, apes and other, in fact, most primates are, are basically couch potatoes. Chimpanzees are extremely physically inactive. If you, if you get a chance to watch chimpanzees for a few hours, you might want to bring a book because they just mostly spend their days sitting on their, on their butts, eating, right, and digesting. Um, they actually do very little physical activity. Maybe they walk about three to four kilometers a day. They might cl climb trees, maybe about a hundred meters per day. But for the most part, chimpanzees are extremely physically inactive. And we became much more physically active in our evolutionary history. And it probably started with the origins of bipedalism when, when our ancestors like you know, Lucy, from this, she was an Australopithecine, they were walking around trying to get food. But the real big kicker was probably the origins of hunting and gathering. And that began sometime between three and two million years ago. And hunter-gatherers have to you know, walk long distances every day in order to get their food. They also have to run occasionally in order to hunt. Um, they also do a lot of digging. They do a lot of physical activity. In fact, studies show that a typical hunter-gatherer today, with, with much more technology than they, we had, say, a few million years ago, they spend about two and a quarter hours a day doing moderate to vigorous physical activity. Right? They're about 10 to 15 times more active than your average American on a daily basis. And by the way, they do this throughout their whole life, right? There are no weekends, there are no bank holidays, 
There are no, there's no retirement. Hunter-gatherers have to be physically active every single day of their life uh, until they, until basically they, they, they die. So, and all that changed, right? Recently, we, we, we invented all kinds of machines to do our labor for us, right? And now if you want water, you just turn a tap, right? Whoosh, out comes your water, right? You don't longer have to carry water. When you want to warm yourself, right, you just turn the thermostat up instead of having to go out and fetch firewood and, and make a fire. Uh, um, when we want food, we just go to the, we drive to the supermarket, we push a shopping cart and we fill our shopping cart with food that's already been produced, right? Our lives have been, been uh, transformed by, by, by machines that do the work for us. And so the result is that the average American can basically spend their, you know, his or her entire day just sitting in a chair, occasionally walking to the bathroom or to make a cup of tea. But basically, we do very little physical activity that's uh, necessary. Most of the physical activity we do is, is, is discretionary. And so that's why we've invented exercise. But that doesn't explain... So we evolved to be much more physically active than our, our, our ancestors, but that still doesn't explain why that Pfeffenbarger result I told you about earlier, why exercise is so healthy. And to answer that, you have to understand that exercise is basically stressful, right? And it's stressful in two ways. One is that it's stressful in terms of how much energy it costs. And the other is that it can cause actual physiological, mechanical stress to all kinds of systems in our body. And both of those turn out to be really important in terms of making exercise, or for that matter, any kind of physical activity healthy. So let's talk about the first one, the energy one. So... This morning I went for a you know a short run, maybe um, maybe four or five miles, and so I spent about four or five hundred calories to run those those few miles. Uh, um, that's not a you know by by marathon standards it's not a huge amount, but it's you know it's a reasonable amount of physical activity. Right? Now those five hundred calories that I spent this morning to go on my 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 run around Fresh Pond um, are energy that uh, in the old days uh, would have been constrained because for most of human evolution. People, you know, didn't have all the energy they wanted. They didn't have, you know, Whole Foods or the Hud's Dining Hall or whatever to get as much energy as they wanted. They worked hard to get the energy. And so anytime they, and energy was limited, right? They didn't have, uh, you know, infinite supplies of, of food. So when energy is limited, you have to make trade-offs, just like with time, right? The, the time you're spending listening to this or watching this little video, right, is time you'll never get back, right? And the same is true of calories, that calories that you spend on a run are calories that you will never get back. And you, you, so you're spending them on physical activity instead of something else. And so in terms of energy, there's two ways in which, which the energy I spent running this morning um, affect the trade-offs. So one of them is that, um, is that I spend less energy on reproduction. Now, uh, this is especially true for women, um, but, but natural selection cares about only one thing and one thing only, and that's how many offspring you have who survive. So, so when you have extra energy, natural selection will, you know, will favor individuals who shunt more of that energy, devote more of that energy towards reproduction. So studies have shown, in fact, uh, Peter Ellison was here at Harvard for many years, did a wonderful study where he looked at people, you know, women who are running around the Charles River about you know, 20 kilometers a week, nothing huge about, right? Just a just a moderate amount of running. And he showed that during the second half of their menstrual cycle, so when they were, it's called the luteal phase, when they're, when they're, when they're fecund, when they can become pregnant, during the second half of their menstrual cycle, the women who were running had 50% lower levels of estrogen and progesterone than the sedentary women. Other, everybody was healthy, nobody was overweight. It was just a, just a kind of sample of, of women who were running and women who weren't running. Now you could say, oh, well, running caused their, their reproductive level, hormone levels to go down. But actually, it was the reverse. It's that, that, that not running, that extra energy those women had available, the sedentary women had available to them, elevated their reproductive hormones by about 50%, increased them. And of course, that, that would increase their, their fecundity in a, in a population that was energy limited. And that has important implications because high levels of reproductive hormones are, in, in, are intimately tied to rates of breast cancer, right? Uh, breast cancer is now, uh, you know, a major cause of mortality for women. And it turns out that women who get just moderate amounts of exercise, and this is a, a well-established fact, 
women who get moderate amounts of exercise, maybe 150 to 300 minutes a week, have 30 to 50% lower lifetime risks of breast cancer just by exercising a moderate amount. And that's because of that, that because they have much more normal, evolutionarily normal levels of progesterone and estrogen. Now, the other thing that those 400 calories or 500 calories I spent this morning did was that they, I didn't devote that energy towards body fat. You know, if you don't spend energy and you have a little bit of surplus, what does your body do with it? You store it as fat because fat is also important for reproduction. If I have more fat, I can draw on that fat in times of, of hardship and I can spend that fat to pay for my big brains and I can spend that fat for nursing if I'm a, if I'm a, if I'm a female. I can spend that fat on reproduction. I can spend that fat for, you know, doing physical activity to get food for my, for my offspring. And so studies have shown that over and over and over again, that the probably one of the most important ways to prevent weight gain, I'm not talking about weight loss, but preventing weight gain is to be physically active. And furthermore, if you take individuals and you, there's like a wonderful study that was done by, by my colleague, Benta Peterson in Denmark, but she got, you know, a bunch of Danish, you know, Vikings, you know, young active guys, she made them sit on a couch for two weeks and not change their diet. And in just those two weeks of being inactive without changing their diet, they added 7% body fat to their bodies, right? And the scary thing is a lot of that fat was in their belly fat, which is particularly harmful fat. So that's one of the benefits of exercise in terms of health. You, you have less uh, weight gain, uh, which of course leads to all kinds of problems. And you spend, and you devote less energy towards uh, abnormally elevated reproductive hormones, which can cause uh, certain kinds of cancers. But that's only half the story. The other half of the story is that when I went running this morning, I stressed my body in other ways, right? So when I'm running and using my muscles, all that energy that I'm using are causing my mitochondria. Those are the little organelles in my cells that are producing energy. Those mitochondria are now producing ATP to keep me moving. That's the, that's the kind of the little batteries that, that our cells use for life. But in, in doing that, they also produce what's called reactive oxygen species. These are little bioactive molecules that have unpaired electrons that can cause havoc throughout your body. It's like when, you're, when your apple burns and turns you know, brown, that's, a, that's, an ox, that's oxidation. And these little reactive oxygen species burn, they oxidize tissues and cells and, and molecules throughout your body. So they cause DNA damage. They cause, um, you know, damage to all kinds of other cells. They, you know, they, they wreak havoc, right? Um, another problem with exercising is that I'm, I'm heating up my body and that causes damage to proteins. I'm, I'm cracking my bones in tiny little micro cracks. You can't see them easily unless under a microscope and I'm causing damage to my bones. I'm tearing my muscle fibers. I'm, uh, you know, every tissue of my body is affected. So that seems like it's bad, right? Exercise ought to be unhealthy. But actually, exercise is very healthy because we evolved to be physically active, right? And so our bodies have a, a range of, of responses to every single one of those damages to not only repair that damage, and, uh, but also to kind of over-repair that damage, to overshoot it, right? The, the analogy I often use is like if you spill like a drink on the floor and then you clean up the floor, the floor is then going to be cleaner sometimes than after the original time you spilled it because you're over, you're, you're cleaning more than the, than, the, than, the, than, the, than, the, than the spill cost. And the same thing is true with our bodies. So when I produce all those reactive oxygen species, when I'm, at, when I'm being physically active, my muscles also produce an, an inordinate amount of antioxidants. Right? These are molecules that have abstruse names like superoxide dismutase and glutathione. That names don't really matter, but the important point is that these react these uh, antioxidants not only mop up the the damage of the, caused by the physical activity in question, but they actually mop up even more damage that's just caused by just being alive. Right? My body also produces enzymes that repair my DNA. Um, exercise also causes me to produce a molecule called brain-derived neurotropic growth factor (BDNF). Just basically like miracle growth for the brain. It, it repairs brain damage. It, uh, it keeps my synapses healthy. It prevents Alzheimer's. It keeps. It actually causes more neurons to grow. Um, when I am physically active, I repair my muscles. I actually, make my muscles stronger. I repair my bones. We uh, we produce molecules that cut cut down on inflammation, chronic inflammation, which causes a wide range of diseases like diabetes and and and, and Alzheimer's and so on. And finally. 
physical activity, exercise, also turns up our aspects of my immune system. My, I produce more antibodies. I produce more, more cells. They're called natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells, which protect, protect me against cancer and various infections. The long and the short of it is that there are dozens, probably hundreds of repair and maintenance mechanisms that are turned on by exercise, um, which we don't turn on at, to anywhere as near the same extent if we say just sitting all day long. And there's the rub because we never evolved not to be physically active, right? Our ancestors never could sit in chairs all day long. They had to go out every day and be, and be physically active. And now we live in this very strange world where we, where we can be physically inactive, but our bodies never evolved for that. We call that a mismatch. And so without physical activity, we don't turn on the repair and maintenance mechanisms that used to be so important for, uh, for enabling us to live long and healthy lives. And here's another important difference between us and chimpanzees. Remember our sedentary chimpanzee ancestors. Chimpanzees rarely live much longer after they stop reproducing. In fact, most animals, once they stop reproducing, they die because natural selection really no longer cares about them, right? If you're no longer producing offspring, you're basically silent to selection. But humans are one of a few species that evolved to be grandparents because what do hunter-gatherer grandparents do? Well, they go out every day and they hunt and they gather and they do things to help their, their children and their grandchildren. They're working, right? They're being physically active. And in turn, what we think is that that physical activity that they're doing as grandparents, and remember what Palfenbarger showed, as you get older, physical activity becomes more important for your health, not less important. But that physical activity that grandparents are doing is what keeping them from aging as rapidly, reducing their vulnerability to diseases, and helping them live longer. And the way it's helping them live longer is by increasing their health span, right? Your health span is how long you live in the absence of chronic disease. And before modern medicine, health span equaled lifespan, right? Because there was no doctor to keep you alive once you got sick. So the bottom line is that we evolved to be physically active for our entire lifespan. When we're young, to develop our capacities, as we age in order to take care of our children, and as we continue to age to take care of our grandchildren. Now, the good news is that you don't have to do enormous amounts of exercise. You don't have to run marathons. You don't have to swim the English Channel. You don't have to climb Mount Everest. It turns out that just about 150 minutes a week can lower a person's risk of mortality by about 30%, which is an enormous amount. So a little bit, at least if you're physically in inactive, just a little bit has a huge benefit. More exercise has increasing benefits, but at a certain point, the benefits tail off and you don't, and you know, running marathons is, is, is completely unnecessary to get, in order to get the benefits of exercise. So the bottom line is that we evolve to exercise as we age, and that by exercising, we not only add years to our life, but also life to our years.